Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Lakeisha Ariangelo, Associate Director at Soho Theatre, um, here with a brilliant group of artists to talk about their, their filmed plays that we have on Soho Theatre On Demand. Um, maybe we should just go around and say who we are and our roles and the shows. I'll start with um, Miranda and David. Hello, I'm David Hoyle and I'm a performer and artist. Hi, I'm Miranda Cromwell and I was the director for Halfbreed, Natasha Marshall's play. Oh, hi, I'm Jen Hayes. Um, I'm the um, creator, uh, writer and director of Hedda after Ibsen. Hi, I'm Cassiopeia Berkeley Ajapong and I'm one of the co-writers of Shuck and Jive. And I'm Simone. I'm one of the other co-writers. One of the other. I'm the other co-writer of Shuck and Jive. <laughs> There's five of us. That's not. That's a lie. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I guess it might be really helpful just to share what these um, wonderful plays are about. Um, I'll start with Cassie and Simone. Would you want to give a brief overview about Shuck and Jive? Yeah, yeah we, I mean, it's always a funny question because it's like about 50 things, but most of all, it's probably about writing a play. Um, it's about two uh, young women of colour working in the performing arts in musicals and opera and trying to traverse an industry that's not for them, that that is constantly pushing back at them in a variety of different ways. Um, and it's the play itself is their attempt or our younger selves' attempt sort of uh, to make a space where they are allowed to be, not even necessarily be anything specific, just be, just exist. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Cassie, how else how would you describe it? I think that sums it up pretty well without any any spoilers. Gotta watch yeah, this no. next. <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, Jen and David, do you want to share us a little bit about Hedda after Ibsen? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, after Jen, I think. Well, go, David, go, you know, you. it's in the... Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, personally, it's been a wonderful project to be involved in and to work with Jen, and it's been an education more than anything else. Uh, and I feel very proud to have been part of it um, because Jen, even in created the character of Henrik Ibsen. So Hedda in this production is actually able to address questions to the creator of Hedda, which I think is a very interesting dynamic. And um, I think that's sort of the hallmark of the production really, that uh, Jen has got hold of it um, and made it more relevant for the times that we're living in now. Um, and I think it's very exciting when a character in a play has the opportunity to ask the creator of that character why they created them the way they did. And so that was very dynamic and I particularly enjoy being involved in that. He did. Um, Miranda. Hello. Half-breed. Um, so Halfbreed is a story written by Natasha Marshall about where she grew up in this small rural village, feeling like, as she describes, the only black in the village. And she wanted to write a play that was partly autobiographical and partly fictional. One, to kind of talk about her village and the kind of macro and micro racial aggressions that happened there, and also the love and the humour and the kind of um, strange community that she found herself in, but also when she had this aspiration herself to move to London, she couldn't find any of the roles that fitted her. She felt like um, really kind of confused by this stereotype that was put on her that she should play roles of like a kind of gangster. And she was like, but I grew up in the village, um, you know, near Somerset. So the story is a kind of attempt for her to play all the roles she wanted to play, everyone, um, including the, the racist people in her village uh, and her best friend Brogan and lots of other people. And I think it, it explores both the kind of um, 
strings and ties and community that you build somewhere and some of the problematic things that can come with prejudice and bigotry and not being able to really be yourself. Um, and it's been on a massive journey because we toured it to India and then we reimagined it here for um, On Demand. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. It's such a great overview. Um, and as you said, yeah, it's had so many different lives. So having, you know, this kind of studio space performances and then main house, and then you did a regional tour as well around the UK, yeah. um, as well as India. Um, so then it has shifted again for, for screen slightly. Um, talk to us, and I'd love to hear from everyone, but let's start with you, Miranda. Talk to us about that process of how and how you adapted it for screen and things you had to consider um any kind of creative approaches and kind of actual pragmatic things as well yeah it was a really interesting process because obviously natasha's before had performed this play hundreds of times in various iterations never for camera though and not for about um two years i think when we decided to do it and we had a really short rehearsal period so it was quite a challenge to adapt the performance for screen because the nature i think of screen in, in that more intimate setting is quite different to the theatricality of like performing to you know 500 people so there was a lot of talking about who is the audience, who are the people at home who are going to be watching it, how can we kind of communicate that story as if you're talking to like one person, so talking to the camera at points when Jazz is really in her kind of most intimate moments, the character. Um, but also what was fun working with Monica, who was the DOP, was being able to do a shot list and talk about the different ways in which we could film it, even though it was all still inside a theatre. How do we like reverse some shots or cut away or are able to kind of um, imagine things cinematically? So it was really, it was a really amazing kind of learning curve. I learned a lot. <laughs> Yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> um, and and I guess an additional question for you, Miranda, then I'll, I'll jump to Cass and Simone for similar things. Um, what experience do you think the audience gets watching it from screen than they do on stage? I think you just get to be so much closer to jazz. Like that's the thing for me that really struck me was, was being able to really focus in on that emotional psychological journey that is happening for that character <clears throat> and being able to also be more dynamic sometimes with the storytelling um, in that choice of being able to come out and then be right in uh, and I suppose there's something more intimate that is created by that. Lovely, I totally hear that. Um, Cassie and Simone, things that you had to think about um, firstly creatively and pragmatically when adapting um, text for, for screen? I think um, Shaq and Jive is a really tricky one to adapt for the screen because the play was so inherently theatrical and it was when we were first conceiving it we were thinking about like how do you put our favorite TV moments on stage? And then it was like, how do you put our favorite TV moments on stage? And then it's gonna be filmed. And then like, what is it now? <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of kind of thinking about whether you kind of, especially because we were in such a, like, is whether you kind of rewrite all the jokes that are about theater to be about television or to be about the fact that things are on screen or do you just let it exist as, as it was in a way and not make, loads of changes to the text and actually I think um, it was more about how it was like re-envisioned to be filmed than it was about making like necessary tangible changes to the actual content of the text and it was more about kind of like when this is kind of um, in the collaborative process of, of making it again um, what did the rest of the team bring in terms of their vision of to how like this could be realized on screen and kind of give the same effect to an audience as they might have had in a the theatre or, or a completely different effect because the experience of watching it on a screen is different. Um, yes, yeah, so actually, Lukish, I think it'd be really interested, interesting to hear from you about what you did to adapt it for screen. Yeah, um, I think you are very right. It is. It did feel inherently for um, stage. However, because you have so many televisual references, 
and um, that kind of the meta levels of playing with, we know that we're in this theatre world and performing to a live audience that you're watching us, but we can use theatre almost in a similar way that you can screen. So for example, having TV game show moments. So we can kind of go, actually, we're actually doing this via screen. So we can kind of use some of those vice. We can have the scoreboard on a kind of graphic animated thing on the screen. Um, they have the kind of, um, cinematic moments of a scene quickly shifting from reality into the minds of the characters who so can kind of kind of revert back to that screen language. Um, so it's quite, it lends itself quite well as well to that kind of screen um, cinematic thing. Um, and just strike, trying to strike that balance of that hybrid and kind of trying retaining that stage feel but using the the things that the play nest kind of um lends itself well to which is those kind of game show moments or those kind of very surreal um otherworldly moments so playing on those things were really quite um useful um and kind of lent itself really well um simone anything else for you i mean i completely agree i think we ended up not changing the text too much i think the probably the bigger challenge was we wrote it at a very specific time and there was like lots of which I think we'll talk about in a bit so I won't go into too much but it was more you know the question of whether we change it to be relevant to the moment and in many ways that wasn't really necessary but oh, all the same problems are still here shocker um but <laughs> but um there were some very timely moments like specific things we referenced at the time of writing that we were like well now something's going to be on screen and therefore not transient in the same way. Do we try and change that to feel like whenever you're watching this film, it could still be now? Or do we set it in a time? So it's like questions like that that we considered and <coughs> made slight tweaks, um, apparently. I hear that. Thank you. We will come back to that latter point you mentioned as well, or the other point you mentioned too. Um, Jen, is there anything you'd like to add to about adapting uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think that, you know, I, I don't call it digital theatre, I call it cinematic theatre. And I think that um, what's the brilliant thing about it is that um, it's a new medium, uh, as I feel that's like a new medium. And it's in the place where theatre and film meet. And so I think that there's been lots of experiments around this that has been filming plays and using multi cameras. But I really think that the new way forward for this is to create this uh, methodology that is, um, and that's what we was working towards within our um, adaptation of Hedda. And Hedda was originally planned to be a live production. Um, it was commissioned by the Arts Centre at Edge Hill University. And David and I did uh, two periods of R&D before we actually got to really pinning down the adaptation of the text. And that was a real gift for us. You know, um, David is a very, I mean, I never thought that anybody else could play header in my mind within this production. Um, you know, when Ibsen created the character, he said that this was, it's a masterpiece of work from him, from the classical canon. And it was said that he placed more of himself into that character than any other piece of work that he'd written. Now, as a man at that time, 200 years ago, he could not express emotions within that, um, within his work that was seen as different, that was seen as alternative, that was, and you know, the queer, queer culture, the queer performance, that queer arena gives us um, a place to explore and really demonstrate how liberating it is to work in, in that way, you know, and David brings a whole fantastic you know um experience of working with audiences and really of um he's a true artist in every sense of the word and so it, it needed somebody of his caliber of his experience of his um developed awareness of reaching an audience to really make this work either in the live context or a cinematic theatrical context and we were ready to go live with it and we had to press pause because the pandemic we got closed down the day before we were meant to go in to do the technical in the theatre 
Um, and, you know, um, that was like, everybody understands what that was and what that meant. But what it meant for us was, we'd also created a body of work from David's um, paintings that were, we worked with the animation um, department at the university and they animated those. Now this was about scale in a live context. When you adapt and take it into a mise-en-scene, some of these things don't carry through. You, for me, I think it was um, about the closeness. You know, somebody mentioned about what it gives us, this, this cinematic theatre, is the ability to go in close. You know, David Lynch does that, you know, within his work. And um, I mean, Derek Jarman, who were, you know, and, and all of that. So, so it, was, it was a digital, it was a piece with digital content and concepts. And we were actually going to do a piece of VR as well because um, we're really interested in, in all these new technologies. So it was a way of, again, like everybody else, taking this text that was live, but transposing it into a cinematic, um, a, a cinematic um, reading of the piece. Um, and it was a joy. Some of the things we had to leave, some of the things um, we, we um, you know, became um, much more profound. And for me as a director, what it allowed me to do was to place David in environments that were really, um, I think would be really relevant to a queer reading of the piece. Um, and we could draw on film, iconic moments of film and, um, and characters. And um, we, you know, we hope that that's what people will get from watching the work. Um, yeah, no, that's great. And I really, um, I really uh, resonated with when you mentioned with a lot of that. And I also now definitely have to go check out this film because I was like, great, love the sound of this. Um, but really resonated with when you talked about the things that you had to um, kind of maybe leave out or things you had to kind of add in, um, things that became more profound. Um, and I feel that because like we've all had these shows that had lives before the pandemic kicked off um, and then had to rethink a, a little bit of what these pieces meant in the time and and how we would think about them for screen um, so Cassie and Simone just coming over to you too um, so we did Shuck and Jive the live version in 2019 so when you had the call from Soho to say we were going to um, film a version of it in 2020 um, you know the world had shifted slightly um, given the events of, of that year, as, as well as the general pandemic, the, I guess, the upsurge of what I call like the civil rights movement of others talk about it as the Black Lives Matter movement. Mm. Um, and given the content of, of the piece, how did you feel about what the piece meant in 2019 to what it meant in 2020 and, and now? Um, and what kind of consideration did you have to give to it, um, knowing that it's going to be a kind of crystallized form in a, a and I'm going to use um, Jen's for, um, term, cinematic theatre. In a way, it was sad. It was sad that it was still relevant because I think even at the time of writing it, I like really hoped it had a short shelf life. I was like, I was like, in two years time, no one will need this play because it would have made the change that it needed to make. And like, everything will be great and like people won't experience like vehement racism when they try just trying to work like but sadly <laughs> it was not the case and I think actually the significance it had was that it felt as though people were more ready to listen to the content of it so again when it came to that question of like what needs to be changed it was like does anything need to be changed or do we just need to be more more aware that maybe people are ready to receive what was being said. That's that's where I'm at. I'm just sad. It's sad. Yeah, I completely agree. I think like you hope that. Well, for a minute there, I think this this always happens when there are big moments in any movement and in these moments of sort of great global uh, tremors, I suppose, that run through society for a second it feels like everything's changed and then the dust settles and you're like oh wait no it's the same but at least everyone felt the tremor this time and in those moments after the tremor people remember what it feels like to feel unsteady people remember what it feels like for things to be 
confusing and scary and all this stuff and they, and in those moments I think they're susceptible to being aware of what others see uh, maybe on a day-to-day basis and yeah like Cass said this was just a way of saying look okay now you're ready this is the moment okay fine look now this is what we've been trying to say <laughs> and I also I also feel like um lots of people th- say and and think it think it was a new thing people had suddenly had this realization and actually in a way it felt like a nice little time stamp every single thing that you know there's this huge huge unbelievable legacy of civil rights activism and um, anti-racism and it was just like our tiny little timestamp to say so many people have been saying this for so long (laughs) rather than just because one person may have realized and it's good that they realized but just because they realized now it doesn't mean it wasn't there all along Um, so I think yeah in the end we didn't we didn't really change much content wise like one or two lines but yeah, like Cass said, it's because nothing really needed to be changed because nothing had changed. So depressing. Anyway, <laughs> um, enjoy the film. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. I hate that. Um, Miranda, is there anything you want to speak on with that, with, with Halfbreed? Yeah, I really resonated with what um, you were both saying there massively. Uh, you come back to it so many years later. I, I mean, I'm tr- I was trying to think when Tash wrote Half Breed, maybe 2015, I want to say, maybe maybe not that late, maybe 17. But she'd been writing it for a long time, you know, in her like nan's bedroom, you know, reflecting on these things in a really intimate way. Um, and you realise, I think what, uh, I think, you know, the global events, Black Lives Matter movement, civil, ongoing civil rights movement, for it to have that kind of global ear where everybody just for a, a moment just tunes in to that noise that has been happening, I think is both validating and heartbreaking and, and all these emotions. And it was hard to come back into a space, uh, you know, dealing with these issues and the racism and the oppression after people have been isolated on their own, having to deal with it in a tiny, you know, chamber by themselves and coming back into this space is sort of re-traumatizing for a lot of people in a lot of ways. And for some people who are just waking up already with an appetite to have that conversation, there's a sort of dissonance, you know, which is which is difficult, um, but at the same time necessary. I mean, a change is painful, isn't it? And I, I think I really learned through so much of this that we all should feel uncomfortable and that is a natural and important thing to feel and some people are feeling that all the time anyway because that's their lived experience yeah. and we shouldn't feel as light skin or white people that we have a right to feel comfortable like ultimately we should be challenging ourselves and there's a lot of growing that still needs to be done and I, I, I'm excited though that this work comes back and it's seen again through a fresh lens through some, for some people and therefore maybe the conversation can start to move on. I, I, I think David could add into that when we talk David talking about Hedda and you know the mental yeah. um, turmoil that she's in and mm. the way existentialism and the whole thing about you know the beautiful death and yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I found the whole sort of all the lockdowns and all the rest of it personally very difficult. So I was able to bring that into the portrayal of Hedda. Um, I mean, I live on my own anyway, but I, it felt a more intensified way of being on your own throughout the lockdowns. And it just seemed to just go on and on. Uh, and not being able to connect with people, I found very difficult. Um, and I think that that does have a parallel with how Hedda sees the world and seems to be challenged when it comes to actually connecting to other people in any kind of sympathetic or empathetic way. So quite an isolated, alienated um, character. And that's how I felt um, personally throughout this pandemic. 
and, uh, and it's been a joy to be directed by Jen because she knows that I'm very sensitive to that sort of thing and knows me very well and um, I think was able to draw on that um, for the good of the project. So it made sense of my unhappiness and disease with what was going on. Mm, I hear that. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you for everyone. Um, so speaking in, in terms of how you how you um, I guess interact with audiences normally, David, when you're doing live performance yeah. and having doing something via screen. Um, how does it how do, what kind of um, ways did you have to think about how you were engaging with the audience when you were doing this film process or how did it change the way you saw audiences or or interacted generally? Well, basically I had to adapt. Uh, I am used to going on stage and the people in front of you and you have that warmth and you have that camaraderie and connection. Um, so you're very aware that you're connecting uh, to the audience through the lens, basically. Um, and it felt almost um, scientific. Uh, it's almost as if you're literally sort of in some sort of uh, microscope. Um, and I think it intensifies the performance in a way. You're, you're isolated, you don't have, not so much the distraction, but it's a totally different environment. Um, and again, I, I think Jen was very sympathetic to that situation, understanding that I am used to a very live audience. I'm very lucky in that respect. Um, so yeah, it was an adaption, basically. Yeah. Could I just add into that as well, so because I think that what um, in, in the way that we worked um, as uh, actor and director, it was a way of going, uh, actually the camera, this is the audience now, but the camera can become many things. The camera can be a character, it can be a crowd, it can be your inner thoughts, it can be your imaginings, it can be, you know, and that in, in lots of ways, the camera can, um, in, the in, in, in the interpretation through the actor's perception of um, objective and why am I here and who am I speaking to, it becomes a, it becomes a different lens, and I think that's very exciting about cinematic theatre. Yeah, because it was a, a, a literal portal. Yeah, you know, we were there, weren't we? Together, yeah. we were following all the um, COVID advice that was taken very seriously. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that. I love the way you think about audiences and how it kind of intensified. The, the kind of uh, product um, and gave it focus and thinking about who the yeah. audience is in that space. It, it makes it very concentrated, so it's a mm. uh, distillation, really. Totally, yeah. Which is which is a slightly different experience to the the live theatre performance yeah. experience. Um, I guess this is open. I want to open for everyone. Then it kind of linked to that. What were the bits that you enjoyed about this style of work in this this um, process? Um, or things that you think worked really, really well? Don't want to go first. Go ahead, Cass. I really liked, um, we got a chance to kind of re-soundtrack the piece because we couldn't get the rights to all the great pop music that was in the original version. <laughs> um, and I think um, just, it's, I think it's maybe just a personal joke, but I'm highlighting it so everyone else can laugh at it when they watch it. Um, the very first track that happens um, at, the, at the top of um, our film, <laughs> Which is basically just like a musicalized version of like people chatting in the theater before the show starts and it just brings me joy <laughs> so that's that's my favorite thing about the new adaptation <laughs> yeah no i completely agree we had a great time like learning how to like <laughs> distantly compose a whole soundtrack for a film which was great fun um, and you guys killed it as well. Just so just <laughs> context for, for everyone else. Yeah. So we couldn't get the rights for all these like you know great pop yeah. music, um, and so basically I said to Kat and Simone, we can either find some like library music which may not be so great, or may kind of come with some other issues and dramaturgical stuff. Or because I know you're both brilliant musicians, singers, artists, do you want to make it? And they were just like, yeah, all right. <laughs> and they just did yeah. it basically a week and a bit, like made brilliant beautiful stunning clever 
music like just like that and they're just like oh we've maybe we're having a tinker around with this but we're, we're having a play with that and it's like well this is fucking amazing <laughs> it's like yes it's actually better some of a lot of stuff is better than we had in the original so yeah stunning stuff we had, oh, a, similar, we had a similar thing going on with um an op the opening song um which was going to be the prologue in the live show and that was what we was going to do as a virtual performance of a, um, a one-person performance for a headset and for david and it was going to be um a, a song that was a very famous song and then when we knew that we were going to be turning it into you know the cinematic uh, theater then uh, very quickly we had to uh, I wrote another song and um, it was brilliant too. And we always sat there going, no, that's not the right sound. No, we can't get that. We've got it. That sounds, David's gone. That sounds too much like the original and all that. But there, I mean, there are six songs throughout the piece anyway. And we've been working with the fantastic composer, Tom Parkinson, and um, who has, you know, composed a fantastic um, original um uh, music uh, soundtrack for it and, and sound design and um, I've written songs for it and these songs have been particularly um, I think like you were saying about you know being um, being like going no we need this we need this song and we need to do it and we need to do it quickly there was one song by the end uh, dead on arrival and it was like oh, and I just went outside and wrote the lyrics and David just kicked it up like that and Tom you know wrote the um, the music and it was just fantastic. It, I think it sort of makes us, it proves to us as artists how um, sometimes, um, you know, um, relying on other other things outside of ourselves can um, not be as, uh, we, we, we don't really fully utilize our, our full creativity, you know, so it was beautiful, yeah. I'd love to have been there when you was writing all those songs. Can't wait to see that now. Yeah, I was just thinking that like, both those both those things sound so exciting. I actually know Simone as an opera singer, so oh, wow. I, I wow. can imagine. Oh. <laughs> I can really imagine. Oh, I love opera. How fun that would have been. And I think for me, it's interesting listening to everyone talk because I go, that is the beauty of theatre, right? It's this collaboration that we're used to, yeah. like being under pressure make the decision and I think film works in quite a different way with everything like very very planned and and pre-designed and I think in the hybrid of the two I think you can find something really exciting like yeah I loved working with the DOP and with Tash and this team and the design to be able to go with the choreography um you know making the choreography fresh with Tash and the DOP about how we were going to film it and where Monica would have to be and kind of doing that on the spot for me was really really exciting and I think seeing how the skill sets of theatre makers and filmmakers can come together to reimagine how we might build something fresh and different feels like a really exciting place. Do you know what I thought about that as well? You know, all the great filmmakers, the great directors had their feet in film. You know, when you think about Vin Vendors, when you think about, um, you know, the, the German expressionism, when you think about the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and all of that, and, and a lot of, you know, they the, the, the cut their teeth, Sam Mendes, they cut their teeth in theatre and then they moved on to film. And I just find it very exciting that we're at this point within, in our, you know, where, where we are as artists, where we can, you know, reinvent, you know, that sort of, to, to reinvent that again, you know, um, as everybody goes, there's nothing new, but there actually is, you know, and there's all these new technologies and there's all this new way of thinking. And um, that's super exciting. Yeah, it's really brilliant what you've just described there. Um, similar to what you were saying, working in this medium uh, for me has been very exciting because Jen got such a wonderful team of people uh, on the project and they were all absolutely brilliant at what they did. Um, Jen's a fantastic songwriter, so I was very aware that I was working with a very brilliant team of people. Um, and I think there were aspects where it almost felt as if I was in um, like a high budget music video, 
And so there were different aspects of the visual realm that we're all familiar with. Um, sort of reapplied and um, a new way of looking at it, if I'm making any sense. Yeah. Well, you've done film, haven't you? Because you've made you've yeah. written your own films and been yeah. your own film films, haven't you? Yeah. So that's, that's why made, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. And I appreciated having Tom Shaw to um, help me design the makeup, help me with the styling, um, the hair, and all the rest of it. And that was fantastic to work very closely with somebody who's very talented like that. You know. And um, Jen made that happen. And it's sorry, like, I, just, well, I was sorry. very comfortable. Yeah. I just wanted to add in before that David doesn't only play he header, he plays other characters within the piece mm. as well. And he actually is in the room with himself at one, one point in it. So we have the br brilliance of film and allowed us to have him playing header and Dale at Loveborg on the screen at the same time, you know, interacting. And I think that that's a very exciting thing. Yeah. Totally, the magic of, of uh, screen world, we can do that. Um, are there any kind of bits of learning or kind of, um, because of the way we've been having to work digitally now and creating these kind of hybrids, are there any things that you uh, want to take within your practice or anything do you want to build and, and shift? Some of you have touched on that already, but are there any things that have, um, that you want to, you're thinking about moving forward? No, I was just gonna say, it's kind of a blend of the answer of like last question and this question in that um, it feels really great to be getting, well, I didn't get into theatre until sort of a bit like, until a bit later on, I live out in the countryside um, and there's, you, there's not really a viable theatre to get to unless you want to travel a couple of hours. Um, so it, it really felt amazing to be making a bit of, theatre that would end up like anyone can watch anywhere I just which makes me so happy obviously you can tour and I love touring as well that's like where my heart is but even that relies on certain infrastructure and certain like systems and people who want to put a theatre there or want to bring a thing there and, and enough you know audience to fund it and there's all these sort of complicated things so it's amazing that anyone now with a laptop and an internet connection can see a play like it just feels really joyous and that's something that I want to keep um thinking about in my practice like how can you make it the most accessible both for people especially in the wake of the pandemic like you know it's it, it's actually been dangerous for many people and continues to be dangerous for many people to attend a live theatre show like in person so how can we make digital theatre not the sort of poor little brother of both theatre and film how can we make it its own amazing art form that means that everyone can experience Absolutely. like great stories and great art. And that's something that I want to continue thinking about for me, definitely um, in my work moving forward. I think thinking about that the other way around as well, you know, we live in an age now where it's more accessible for people to be able to make their own work, make their own film, think about new collaboration of how that might happen and how to get that to audiences. So we're not only relying on these theatres that have gatekeepers and the elitism that exists within them, we can also think about how to directly connect with other artists and make work that lives outside of you know, a strictly kind of theatre season or programme might be in association with. And, and there's ways in which we can start to literally open those borders. And I think even within my own mind, to stop my thinking only just being about certain spaces that I might want that th that theatre to be in, but start thinking more about different communities that I might want to work with or different stories that I want to tell. And where do I get, how do I get those stories to the audiences that should see them? And they may not just be physical spaces, they may be digital spaces. And so it chimes in with what you're talking about with accessibility, Simone, but also I think creatively that opens a lot of spaces in my mind, which feel like really exciting to explore. I mean, for me, it's um, it's opened up my thinking around, you know, the placing of audiences within a live show context. Um, I think I want to explore how digital and uh, and new technologies can be 
incorporate it to heighten the experience of the audience and poor performers and make more participatory work. It's a very difficult word to say that participatory, yeah. but I managed it. Um, and when we were doing shooting header at Soho Theatre, um, the idea, we, we, we shot it in April um, and the pandemic was um, of 2021. And the pandemic was, um, the lockdown was still in force. And, um, but we, we did have an idea around bringing an invited audience in who could dress in um, appropriate, you know, to how they want, you know, within that, the context of the, uh, the, of the, of the, the aesthetic. And then I did have an idea of creating a whole prologue with them in um, before we actually got into the piece and using the building as, um, you know, as um, a film set basically, and what we could do within that building and how we see spaces in, in that way. I do think it's really interesting though, that we can, we can reimagine uh, dedicated theatre spaces to be, um, you know, to be much more versatile as well. And I completely agree with you about going out into different environments. And a lot of my background is in making site specific pieces as well. But, um, but that is very exciting, I think. And there's all these, you know, these new technologies, holograms, virtual and all that. And, and audiences need to be a part of that. They don't, they need to be not passive. They need to be proactive within what we're doing. And um, I think we, we can, we can, we can change a lot of thinking and we can, you know, we can do what art is meant to do. You know, we can disturb and we can get right to them. And, you know, what, what David's work does, you know, in a live context when he's out there and he's talking about what's happening to people, you know, in an in, in everyday experience by politically, you know, emotionally, um, you know, from a mental perspective, from an artistic perspective, all of those things. Right, great. Love that. I'm well, feeling very motivated from hearing all of that. Thanks. Great. Jane. Yeah, love that. <laughs> um, so I guess on that, and I'll, I'll make this the, the final question open for everyone, and you've already kind of touched on it, all of you have slightly, but what are the things that excite you about the arts moving forward or what are your hopes for our industry moving forward after the last couple of years that we've had? What are the things that you really, is really galvanising you or that you're really hoping for? I really... I hope more than anything that we have learned <laughs> some lessons. Uh, I think that there's been a lot of conversation and there has been a lot of resource available and a lot of information. And I think we can't go back to any of the arguments that we didn't know. Um, we didn't know this was happening. We don't understand why we've ended up with a season of no female writers of uh, white cast. We don't know. We just didn't. We just couldn't find anyone. Uh, all those kind of <laughs> excuses. I really hope that they leave the room because it, it, it is, you know, it's it comes from a place from being an ignorant position into a place of being a willfully oppressive position. And I think that we all should have the courage to call that out much more now where we see it. And I think, for, you know, think about our own privileges, the intersections of people's experiences and try to imagine a world of theatre that reflects the world that we actually live in and have voices and spaces and styles and forms of performance that also reflect the things that are going on in our world right now. I feel like it's a massive time for theatre to shift into um, current thinking and, and be progressive and be forward thinking and we live here in London, but also regionally, there are so many amazing artists and, and form breaking things happening and we need to give them uh, visibility and, and space. And, and I think from that, really exciting collaborations will form. Um, so I have some hope, <laughs> I have some trepidation. Uh, but I do think that if we can learn from what we have experienced and, and gone through together, there are some really exciting artists out there. So, yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Like I just, everything you just said really resonates. And I think as well as making sure we reflect the world, I think, I think we can all do more as theatre makers. And I hope, I hope 
I hope the industry does to affect as well. I think we can make change. We can, uh, this sounds really idealistic and <laughs> over the top, but you know, like art oh, can change lives. It can though. Our whole skill set, our, our sort of the basis of our skill set is communication. I think that's what we spend ages learning and struggling to improve ourselves at. And I think so often we get lost with what we're actually communicating and how we're communicating it. And, you know, if we're making a piece about the environmental destruction or, you know, the climate crisis or something, how can that piece actually do some good in the space as well? Or, you know, from checking our own carbon footprint in making the show to can we use any of it for lobbying or for you know supporting researchers or you know is what can we do to uh make sure that we're not just commenting but that we're moving things forward practically as well um i think i hope we can contribute to that in some way and yeah that's my hope for the industry that it that we hold ourselves to a higher standard to make positive change not just in our own industry but beyond as well it kind of ties into this also about conversation and communication and it's just about the idea of kind of not exclusively working with people who you agree with I think so often we have a tendency to just want to like be in chill because those are the happy places those are the best rooms it's like we're all on the same page we're doing this thing it's going to be great but actually uh like the industry challenging itself to work with people who actually like we're like we're not we're not me we're not seeing eye to eye and actually like the process of that collaboration being something that helps us like get closer to not even necessarily agreeing but just understanding each other I think that's something I'm really hopeful for. Mm. Um, I think it's um I think it's we've everybody has realized that we can't take the arts for granted you know it's a very massive important part of our lives it is you know without without art without creativity then as human beings we are um we're fallow you know we are we're lost. We, um, and I think it's. I think the positive thing, and it's. It's actually. I'm probably just regurgitating what you've already said here in terms of you know um, making people think in different ways and breaking the glass ceilings and and open things up. And I mean, as a maverick theatre maker based in the north of England, as a woman, um, you know, a working class woman, um, it's been. It hasn't been the easiest of you know. When I was at university, it was. I went into late education, which is another story, but with two kids and it wasn't possible for me to go and do you know um uh, be an assistant director in in London to build up the you know so I think that's what the what the thing about what is happening now and it's like it's it's like people have, have been forced in a way to rethink and and you know with with everything that has come forward in terms of Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement and all of those wonderful things that have been you know just cracking open everything um I think that it's a really uh, uh it can be if we harness it a really fantastic uh time for us within you know to go out fighting you know yeah, it's, yeah, it really, you know. yeah, well, it definitely is essential that we create art because um, we kind of know that the mainstream media does have a right wing bias. They are trying to make us believe that there's some kind of concrete reality um, that is illusionary and only really represents one or two people and maybe the interests of big business. And so one of the few arenas that we have is art, expression, film. And um, I'm hoping that from this debate, maybe people watching will have a go themselves at creating some artwork and reflecting true realities as opposed to the faux reality that I believe at the moment we're very much victims of. And we've got to fight back. Art and expression really is where it's at. It's that important. It's a matter of life and death. And, it, and I've just got to say, it's been a real pleasure to be in the company of everybody today. Lots of love to everybody. Keep fabulous, keep strong. And remember, when it comes to reality, 
I'll leave it with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a brilliant way to end it. Thank you, um, everyone. I, you know, echo all of those great, great things. Thank you for being so wonderfully uh, articulate and and sharing your experiences and your processes and and uplifting us. I feel very like. I know. Nice. There's so many yeah. work. Let's go out there and do our <laughs> thing. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, totally. Um, so just a reminder for those watching, um, Header after Ibsen, Half Breed, Chuck and Jive, Mum and Sessions are, will be available to stream on Soho Theatre on Demand over February and March. So please do head over there to check those out. Thank you everyone that has joined us to talk about your work um, today. It's been really lovely to listen to you all. I um, appreciate you all and um, stay safe and well. Thank you.